Once more as I come into your home and I pray more so than in your home that the Word, the living Word, would uh, penetrate. Paul told the church, beyond the marrow, beyond the bones, go to the living soul. Today I'm again during a part two of the task of worship, but I almost changed the name, not the message, but I almost changed the name to POW Training, Prisoner of War. As I look around and my heart is hurt, but then my heart is also rejoicing. Paul says, I'm caught in between. Do I want to leave these old bones here and go to be with Christ, or do I want to stay as a prisoner in these clothes? I see the Christian church, and thank you to Jan, that we need some POW real training as Christians to know how do we act before a holy God. Christian churches and can never be a nickel in the slot worship. It, it just can't happen. Most of us has probably seen the old Maybe on TV or something, you just put a nickel in the slot, you pull the lever and a bunch of things go across, and if they all line up, you get a blessing. Most of the time they don't. So when we come into God's house, or when you go into your closet, or wherever you are, you can worship. There's a misunderstanding at large about worship. We are worshiping to gather here, but if you can't worship in your job, in your home, in your shower, wherever, you can't worship here. This is just an extension of your worshiping Christ wherever you are. I'm sure if you've ever been really, really sick, you know what I'm talking about. Paul's writing unto the Romans. He wants to encourage you. And today's scriptural reference is found in Romans 1, 18-24. Now Paul's not in Rome yet. He has a desire. In fact, we back up and read 1 Romans. He said, I've always had this desire to go to Rome, but I've been prevented from going, but now through the grace of God or through the grace of Christ, he didn't even have to pay for his way. Rome took up that, but he went as a prisoner. So Paul was a POW, prisoner of war. My son took POW training once, and he said it was really, really tough. He said they could do anything emotionally, spiritually, physically, but harm the body. He said they couldn't hit us. But he said they could get in your face. He said, I went through all darkness for a while, lost track of time, all light, all noise, all silence, interrogated, mistreated. And then when I went to actually battle in Afghanistan, they give me an update. Just in case. I was a prisoner of war. Christians, are you prepared to be a prisoner in your own skin, in your own house? You see, many times in life, we get the 
what is it, an abduction syndrome? Where we're captured and it's not too long until we have a relationship with our captive. Kidnap a teenage girl and you mistreat her long enough, she'll start to love you. In fact, she'll start to worship you. Even though she's mistreated, belittled. Christians have been mistreated and belittled on a greater scale since time began. But now, Christians are starting years ago, and that syndromes continue to like our captive. See where I'm going? Someone, Wada said, my job is to prepare you for battle. Paul said that. Jesus said that. But the tire and the rubber is to make sure you have everything you need to accomplish your mission. Brian does that. Doesn't send his men out without what they need. Don't go to a gunfight carrying a knife. Gives them a weapon. Is worthless until he shows you how to use it. That's what this Bible is. This is the greatest weapon. Now, Jesus is the power. Never forget that. Listen to where Paul is. If you read this, I almost read it with tears. And then I'm going to read one more found in Revelation. I hope we're going to settle on the new throat. Romans chapter 1, just starting with 18, and the captive says, God's wrath against man. The wrath of God is being revealed from heaven against all the godliness and wickedness of men who suppress the truth by their wickedness. Since what may be known about God is plain to them, because God has made it plain to them. Since the creation of the world, God's invisible qualities, His eternal power, and His divine nature have been clearly seen, being understood from what has been made, so that men are without excuse. For although they knew God, they neither glorified Him as God nor gave thanks to Him. But their thinking became fruitful, and their foolish hearts were darkened. Although they claimed to be wise, they became fools. They exchanged the glory of the immortal God for images made to look like mortal man, and birds, and animals, and reptiles. We didn't put it in the bulletin, but turn with me to Revelation, a very easy book to find. Revelation chapter 2. I just want to read one verse. Chapter 2, verse 20, and this is the letters to the churches. This is the third church that Jesus describes in his letter to John. And this one will put a chill up your spine. It did mine. And I pray that chill never leaves. He's talking to the church of Tyatera. Listen to what Jesus says. Revelations 2, verse 20. Let me just read the whole letter, the beginning of the letter for you. To the angel of the church of Thyatira. These are the words of the Son of God, meaning Jesus, whose eyes are like the blazing fire and whose feet are like the burnished bronze. I know your deeds, your love, your faith, your service, your perseverance, and that you're now doing more than you did at first. Here's the chill. Nevertheless, I have this against you. You tolerate the woman 
Jezebel. Let us pray. Our Father in heaven, words, Lord, are cutting this morning. They're cutting me, Lord. They're cutting who I am as a man, who I am as a teacher and a pastor. Lord, I pray this morning that there's some cutting being done throughout the Christian church, throughout this place this morning. Lord, I pray that the Holy Spirit would move in our very midst this morning. That would come into this place not to encircle the place, but to fear us, Lord. Come into our hearts, Lord, and speak to the very core of who you created us to be in the likeness of you. May we dispense, Lord, with everything that's not needed and just seek you. In my weakness now, Lord. May we only preach the living word. Yes. Christ's name I pray. Amen. If you remember last week, I brought up Aiden Tozer as Aiden was teaching in his book on worship the difference that it makes and how it is so almost 100% necessary. To know the difference between worshiping a living God. And that's why I say the God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. Week after week after week. That's never going to change. And how Cain took upon himself to just assume what would please God. And he completely disregarded the nature of God. Worship. Acceptable to God is based upon knowing the God of the Bible. And when we're captured, we need to remember that we have an enemy. And society is growing worse and worse about this word that we call love. How we should just love everyone. And they blatantly disregard the word. And they dismiss sin as if it's just a coincidental issue. The Bible teaches that Jesus hates. And one thing he hates, he hates sin. He hates someone to come before his father without him. You see, Jesus asked his disciples one time, what are people saying about me? Who do they think I am? You all know the answer if you know any Bible history at all. They say, oh, some say you're John the Baptist, some say you're Elijah, some say you're a prophet. And Jesus got me on all the clutter. That's that NBC News we hear at night. That's nothing but clutter. And my mind is getting smaller and smaller and smaller, and that, that place in there to instill the truth must be held secure. So we can't fill our mind up with clutter. But then he got beyond the clutter. There we go. He says, but who do you say? That question is still answered today. You ask the common person on the street, who is Jesus? I don't know the ground. But I pray when you're held prisoner of war and someone asks you, who is Jesus? That's after hours of darkness and hours of light and hours of noise and hours of solitude. Can you still say in your mind, he is my Savior? And I know him. But the question is, does he know you? Wow, what a difference. 
I know Donald Trump. Donald Trump don't have a clue who Donnie Savage is. I'm praying for him. Spoke to a dear friend this past night. I don't know, one night last week. He's from down south, and his name left me. It's supposed to be James. But it'll come back. And we was talking about the church. In fact, we was talking about West Marlin District. And I'm not going to get into all the issues. But he says, Donnie, remember Lazarus? I said, well, yeah, I know the story of Lazarus. He said, do you know who went to see Jesus? Yes, yeah, some servants went to see him. Do you know what they told Jesus? I said, yeah, they wanted him to come see that. He said, no. That ain't what it says. I think it's in John 11, 3, maybe. I think. Bear with me just a moment. Let me see if I can find it. But you know the story is Lazarus was sick. And uh, his disciples uh, was with him some distance away. John 11. I'm surprised. <laughs> it says the death of Lazarus. And he says, the disciples went to him, or the servants went to Jesus. Listen to what it says. Now a man named Lazarus was sick, that had Mary and Martha's brother. And he was from Bethany, the village of Mary and her sister Martha. This Mary, whose brother Lazarus now lay sick, was the same one who poured perfume on the Lord and wiped his feet with her hair. So the sister sent word to Jesus. Now, this is it. Lord, the one you love is sick. Not the one that loves you. Isn't that awesome? <clears throat> Jesus loves me. We live in a theology world today that is sick and it's hurting. And we live in a world today that doesn't like the word. Oh no, he's, he's for everybody. So Jesus, John 3.16, for God so loved the world that he gave his only son that whosoever believeth in him. We can't leave it at whosoever, church. We can't leave it at he fed the 5,000, church. We have to come that he loves me. I don't know. I guess it's a beautiful funeral this week. It's pretty cool. Dear friend that passed away at 89, I think, Elmer yeah, Wolf. From Orr. How many of you know where Orr is? Maybe one? Oh, we got one that knows where Orr is, too. That's <laughs> like. Anyway, I went in to see him a year or so ago. He didn't have a clue who it was, but he passed away. Had ten children. Five had passed away and five girls right there on the front row. And it wasn't a, a dreary funeral. It was about 50-50. I could just see it in their eyes. Who believed in Jesus and who didn't. So I said, boy, now's an opportunity. Lord, just give me something to say. And you don't say you bend down and bow down to Jesus at a funeral. That's foolishness. I said, do you want to know if you're saved? Do you truly want to know if you're a born-again believer? I said, we've all heard the words. Just hold on. In times of struggle, just hold on. You know where we're going with this. Anybody that knows me knows I see a smile here. I know where he's going. I can finish that statement. I said, here's how you know. You know.
know when you know. If you believe in Jesus, and you're born again and covered by the blood. In times of struggle, the deepest, deepest struggle, when you're held prisoner, I said, your dad's passed away from the body. He's still who he is. Nothing's changed but his address. Your friend has passed away, and you're holding on. I said, you can hold on to members. That's, that's, he told us to do that. But I don't want you to hold on now. I want you to let go. Just 100% let go. Let go of Jesus. Let go of his word. Let go of his teaching. Let go of the comfort. I want you to just completely disassemble yourself from Christ. Because one day it's going to happen. Then I want you in that next moment to see how that soul is. Are you feeling peace? Or are you feeling trouble? If you're feeling peace, it's oh God. You're born again believer. If you're feeling, where are you, Jesus? You're in the hell. You see, it's not about holding on. It's about who holds on to you. You see, when Cain came to God and he brought his very best and he wanted to worship God, God never held on. You see, Cain viewed sin as just, ah, uh, it's just wind dressing. You see, if Cain represents man at his best, according to Paul, he would worship his man at his worst. You see, what was happening, they began to worship creation <coughs> instead of creation, the creator. Paul talks about this on Mars Hill when he's pretty kind to them in Athens. Remember I read the scripture a few weeks ago that as he was waiting for the other disciples to come that he walked around and he was at their Arapagan meeting and he said, I see you are religious in very many ways and as I walked around I see the names of your gods, and I even seen the name of the unknown God as whom you worship, and whom you call is unknown. Now I am going to proclaim to you, and he was really, really kind to them. Paul talks about this pagan worship to the Romans, and he drops all kindness. He talks to them, and he doesn't have one nice thing to say about them. He condemns them outright because they knew God. Did you ever hear someone say that? I've heard the question, well, what about, you know, they always go to the deepest, darkest jungles of Africa. In the deepest, darkest jungles of Africa, they know God. Or God is a liar. Scripture says, and I recorded it and read it, they are without excuse. Does that put a chill up your spine? My daughter's a math teacher, but she teaches way more than math. When the students are well enough, she gets to math, but you've got to get through all the puberty before you can teach. In the Christian walk of life, we have to get through the POW. Many times, that's there for a purpose. Paul says they knew God, but they failed to glorify Him. They were neither thankful, but became vain in their imagination. You know what the word vain means? Picked up that little book so right there on my study. It means worthless, 
without value, misunderstanding, and their foolish heart started with God. God was plain to them because God has made it plain to them. For since the creation of the world, invisible qualities, His eternal power and divine nature have been clearly seen, being understood from what has been made, so that men are without excuse. Therefore they do God, and neither glorify Him and give thanks to Him. Although they claim to be wise, they were fools. Here's what they did. They took God and they made Him into the image of man. They took man and they made Him in the image of a bird. They took the bird and they made the bird into the image of an animal. They took the animal and they made it into the image of a reptile. They had a downward spiral. They said, if I can worship God as a true and living God, I can worship Him through man and make this image. You see, the Christian church is that close from crossing the rumble strip. Did you ever get woke up by a rumble strip? <laughs> right here's one got woke up by a rumble strip several times. You're going down the road and I was like, oh, 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 oh. <laughs> That's what Jan says is happening now to Rabbi. God has given us a rumble. We need to glorify Him when we are in a prisoner. We need to glorify Him that worship flows from an encounter that is so deep within us that the world can't shake it. It almost has to come of an understanding of just who God is. They can't rob you from that once it's instilled within you. Paul said they knew that their imagination was full. My church, one of the ingredients that you need to worship God is a confidence that God is who He says He is. My mind goes back to the book that oh, dear sister gave me. It was really hard to read. You know where I'm going with this one again. One word I got from that entire book supersedes. Jesus supersedes everything. Do you know why he could take a loaf of bread and turn it into thousands of loaf of bread? He owns math. Do you know why he could stop the waters? He owns it. Do you know why he could stop the wind? The wind's under his command. Do you know why he gave you the image of himself, the Father, the Son, the Holy Spirit? So that you would have command over the same enemy. Now, I'm not saying that's easy, but I'm saying I got to stop here. <laughs> Shall we pray? Our Father in heaven, oh, as my daughter goes from five, four, three, two, one. I pray you can reverse the trend. Lord. May we start with you. And if it's not recorded in your word, it's a lie. Mm -hmm. Lord, when we're POW, maybe sometime in our own heart or in mind, may that still voice of the Holy Spirit just speak to us and move us to freedom. <coughs> Thank you.